God is not through with you. Your best days are still ahead. Your best hours are ahead. Your most fruitful ministry is ahead. Friend, listen, it is the launching day. It is the day that we set out into deeper waters, not into the shallows of the harbor. It is not the time where we anchor into the harbor and say we've done our part. No, it is the day that we say by faith, God, until the Lord Jesus Christ comes, there is room for one more. We will launch out and get that one, no matter the call, no matter what we have to do. If God is for us, who can be against us? And we set sail. Good morning, church family. It's Pastor Ben, and I just want to welcome you to our online worship experience. If you've been worshiping with us every week, I just want to tell you I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud that you're continually walking in your faith so that you can lead your family, your friends, and the world closer to Jesus. If you're with us for the first time today, I'm so thrilled. I believe God's going to do a miracle in your life today. He's going to draw near to you, and you're going to see him like you've never seen him before. Church family, don't hold back. Let's welcome those who are with us for the first time. Let's go to the comment section. Give some love to those who are with us. Tell them you're so glad to see them. If one of your friends is tuned on, go ahead and call them out by name. Tell them you're glad to see them today. Today, God's going to do an amazing thing. He's going to work in a powerful way. As people are gathering online right now around our Facebook Live event, I want to just give you one big announcement. If you plan to gather back with us in person when we're allowed to gather back in person with the per correct procedures and protocols put in place, then write down May 31st. May 31st at 10.30 a.m., we're going to meet at the Clearer High School football stadium. We're going to have plenty of room for you to spread out and have social distancing guidelines put in place. You can bring blankets, chairs. You can bring hot dogs. I don't care what you bring. Just come and be a part of it if you feel comfortable. It's a family time of worship, and that's important because we should be worshiping together as a family. Some of you are worried about your kids. They're going to be loud. Life's loud. Your kids are not a problem to be solved. Your kids are a part of this family and we can't wait to hear them and see them. If they want to run around the field, if they want to color with coloring sheets, if they want to play on their iPads, if they want to engage in worship. Like life is about our family and your family and their family as well. For those who don't feel comfortable, we'll continue to meet at 10 a.m. right here on Facebook Live. Can't wait to see you. Let's go ahead, let's gather together, let's come together around this Facebook Live event, and let's worship our Heavenly Father. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness from poor cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Leaving signs and wonders, I have resurrection power. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Oh, my parade belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from dead to life. This grace who wrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'll justify. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh.
Jesus Christ for the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. that an amazing time of worship that we just had together. Listen, we're about to have our children's moment. Before, so go ahead, grab your kids, get them around the computer if they're not already there. Before we actually have that moment with Candice, I want you just to go ahead, and if you're not following us on social media, you really need to. If you want to stay up to date with what's happening, if you want clips of these services and of other information, you want to follow that so you can stay up to date on everything that's happening and so that you can help advance the kingdom through a digital age. So go ahead. Instagram is Collectivist Church. If you're watching this on Facebook, go ahead and like this on Facebook. Or you can go to our website if you're just looking for up news or information about us, and that's collectivist.church. If you're there on our website, you can go ahead and fill out a connection card, or you can look at the comment section and find one as well. Or you can go ahead and give your tithes and offerings online by clicking the Give tab. You can also just text the number on the screen, the amount that you'd like to give to the number that's on the screen, and we can continue to advance the kingdom like never before. Now that you have your kids, let's gather together for this special moment in God's Word. Hey everybody, so happy to be with y'all again today. As you can see, I'm under a palm tree. That's right, we decided to take this weekend, run down to Florida, have a little family time. We've been so disappointed with canceling our spring break trip and, and losing other family vacations and things like that that we were expecting. So we decided to treat ourselves and just get out of town this weekend. Coincidentally enough, we are talking about disappointment today. It's something that every single one of us hand, um, is faced with, especially over the past few months. I know that we have all had a lot of disappointment you know, we were supposed to go to California for spring break, canceled. We were going to be in Florida for Easter, canceled. So we really kind of got dealt a very sad couple months. But you know what? It's completely normal to be disappointed. Once again, talking about David, David dealt with disappointment, a really big disappointment. You know, when David was king, he had trained his oldest son, Absalom, to take over that role. He just expected one day his son would be king. So he spent his entire life from childhood training him, teaching him what it's like to be a good king and how to lead. So you can imagine how disappointed David was when he found out that Absalom wanted to be king, but not the way David expected. Absalom had been going behind David's back and turning his people against him. He tricked the people into thinking that David didn't really have time for them, that he didn't care about them. He told everybody, I'll be a better king. My dad, he doesn't have time for you. Bring your problems to me. So as the people started seeing this, they started to side with Absalom. Once David knew what was going on, he knew it was only a matter of time before Absalom and his men came to him to kill him. So did David panic? Did he freak out? What did he do? We've learned that David, throughout all of his decision making, always went to God. And that's what he did. David and the followers that he still had, along with some of the priests, decided to leave the city. They took the Ark of the Covenant and got out of the city instead of confronting Absalom. While they were there, they made a sacrifice of worship to God. After that, David told the priests that were with him, take the Ark of the Covenant back to the city. I trust God. If he wants me to be king, he'll take care of it. And that's what happened. David had complete confidence that God would take care of the situation, even though it may have been scary. 
mean, his own son had turned against him, and he didn't know what was going to happen, but he knew to put his trust in God. And that's what we can do today. Disappointment is something that every single one of us is going to face. No question about it. We will all be disappointed at some time. But we have to remember that even when things don't go the way that we planned, that God always knows what to do. He is in control. He's got complete control, and God's plan is better than any plan that you or I or anybody could come up with. God's got this. So whenever you're faced with disappointment, just remember that. Ask him for help through it and trust in him that he will carry you through. So guys, this actually wraps up our lesson on um, our emotions and, and kind of following the life of King David. I'm super excited to start a new lesson next week. You know, all throughout this, we've talked about how when David needed God, he went to him in prayer. So starting next week, we're going to learn how to pray. I'm super excited about it. I love our Zoom meetings so much. It's really great getting to connect with you guys throughout the week. This week, since it's a holiday weekend, I know a lot of you guys are probably out of town, probably at the lake, splashing in the pool. So we're going to put a hold on that for this week. But next week, we're going to pick right back up with it. Um, so I can't wait to see everybody then. Have a great rest of the weekend. And I will hopefully actually see you guys with my eyes next Sunday at the football field. Can't wait for it. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Well, all right, today we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4. You can go ahead and kind of thumb over there in your Bible or in your Bible app if you like. Um, the scripture will also pop up on the screen. Today, I mean, this series, actually, we're in this idea called proper perspective. For the past three weeks, we've talked about how, what would it look like if we saw people as God saw people? What if we saw people properly and we didn't see them through our finite clouded earthly lens but through a kingdom lens what if we started seeing them as sons and daughters and brothers and sisters what happens when we see them incorrectly and what can we do to shift our perspective and see them properly that's been the question well we're going to continue in this idea of proper perspective but i want to actually shift from how we view people to how we view god now today's message is going to be a refresher message for some of you. Some of you on March 24th when we were still gathered in person, we looked at this idea that God is good. We actually said let's reconsider God. Let's change our perspective of what we currently view, who we currently view as God, and try to look at Him properly. And today I just we need to start there before we continue the next three weeks where we learn to see God properly and to see what He has for us. So Galatians chapter 4 is where we are going to be today, and it's really important for us to understand that there's something more that we can all learn today. So today, go ahead and turn to your family, go ahead and turn to your friends, or just turn to yourself and say, there's more, there's more. There's more to God than we know. There's more to God than we see, and we know that we still see dimly on this side of heaven, but that's just an excuse for us not trying to see as clear as we can. We want to see God as clear as we can. We want to understand Him the best we can. You see, Jesus longs to show you true perspective, and that perspective, that truth, will free you from a life that has lived with limited potential just waiting for heaven. God has something more in this moment, and we have to draw near to him to learn more. Here's why. Perspective is always determined by location right? Your perspective, how you see something is always determined by your location. So like if you've ever been um, sightseeing or if you've ever been like hunting or done anything and you hear somebody say, hey, hey, come look at this or do you see that? And you look from where you are, you may not see it. And they're like, well, come over here. And you stood next to their shoulder and they kind of pointed up and you followed their arm. And you're like, oh, I see that. Well, we have to understand to see things like God sees things, we have to see God properly so that we can get near to God so that we can see them as he sees them, right? Get it? Perspective is always determined by our location. How we view God, we say this a lot, how we view God 
will determine how we relate to God, and how we relate to God will have a direct impact on how we display God. I'm going to say it again. How we view God will determine how we relate to God, our relationship with God, right? And how we relate to God will have a direct impact on how we display God. And we believe as a church that God has called us to be in the world, to win the world, to be in the world, to show God to the world, to advance the kingdom, to make things clear. But how can we make clear what the things of the kingdom are if we don't even know what they look like? Instead, let me just let me just pose this. If we don't see God properly and we try to display him improperly, we have to ask ourselves, are we actually advancing the kingdom? Or are we actually setting up barriers for others to come to know him? When you have false information, you begin to live a false reality because perspective is your current reality. And if you view things with improper perspective, then you are living an improper reality, one that is limited and not fully what God's called you to. Satan longs to distort and corrupt your view of God. We know that he has no power over the resurrection that Jesus had to redeem us, to save us, to call us back to what we were called to be and to live eternally with him as well. So instead he distorts and he misleads us through our minds to viewing something different. Satan's a tricky little sucker. He knows that he has no match for God, but he can get in our minds and our minds and our feelings will often mislead us. Listen to this. Feelings are an okay gauge, but they're a horrible guide. Like your feelings, oh, well, I just don't feel like that's right. Or, you know, I'm just doing what I feel is best. I just going to live life how I feel. Your feelings will mislead you. Some of our biggest mistakes in life are caused by following our feelings. Feelings are an okay gauge. God gave us feelings, but they're a horrible guide. So we're going to be in Galatians chapter 4, and it says this. But when that era came to an end, talking about this era of the law, so... Um, between the fall of Adam and sin entering the world and Jesus who redeemed things back to what they were deemed, there was this middle space that God put a law in place. This law was a hedge of protection around his people because sin always is followed by death. Death is always catching up to sin. So God wanted to protect his people. So he had to put in a lot of rules and a lot of regulations and he built this fence or this hedge around his people called the law. And he said, if you abide by this law, you Will be safe. Death cannot catch up to your sin. But if you step outside of the law, then all of a sudden you've stepped outside of my hedge of protection and just the way things operate, death always catches up to sin. They are companions in this, right? So Jesus said, and I mean, God said of this law, and it says, but the era had come to an end. So the law, so that we're about to get rid of this law and take on what Jesus came to fulfill. He came to bring us back, right? And the time of fulfillment, that relationship fulfilled the rules, the relationship fulfilled the rules, and, uh, and the, the time of fulfillment had come. God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, born in the era of the law, Yet all of this was so that he would redeem, look at that, and set free all those who held, he held, all those held hostage to the written law so that we would receive our freedom and full legal adoption as his children. By the way, if someone's adopted there, you're just as much that child as it was biological. So Jesus was sent, God's only son was sent to make a way for you to be adopted as sons and daughters as well. And so that you would know for sure that you were his true children. You see that, right? True children, not uh, partial children, not, uh, you know, you're kind of his child. You're not Jesus, but you're his, no, you're his true child. God released the spirit of sonship into your hearts, moving us to, a cry, to cry out intimately, My Father, you are tr our true Father. So no, now we're no longer slaves under the law, but we enjoy being God's very own sons and daughters. And because we are his, we can access everything our father has, for we are his heirs of, we are heirs of God through Jesus the Messiah. All too often we live a life with this limited but, and skewed perspective of, God, of who God is and who we are to God. So what are a couple of things that we need to learn about our Father? The first thing to gain proper perspective is you have to learn that God is loving. 
John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He loves you dearly. 1 John 3, 1, how great is the love the Father lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And many people say, if God's so loving, then why is this happening? Or why is this happening? It's because we have an improper view of who God is and what he's doing. And also we have an improper view of who we are to God. God is longing to use you and I as a conduit, as a source to pour blessings and goodness into the world. So when we see something that breaks our heart, if we see something that makes us say, if God was good, why is this happening? We need to ask ourselves, if we are brothers and sisters, then why are we allowing our other brothers and sisters to suffer? God is loving. Next, we have to understand that God is forgiving. 1 John 1, But if we freely admit our sins when His light uncovers them, we'll be faithful to forgive us. He'll be faithful to forgive us every time. God is just, just to forgive us of our sins because of Christ, and He will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, we have to understand about these attributes. They're not just attributes of God. They are who He is. God isn't forgi- He isn't one who forgives. He is forgiving. It's His character. It's who He is. He is. God is, our, is loving. It's not just what He does. It's who He is. And also, God is giving. Matthew 7, verse 11, So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask? So God is love. He is. It's who He is. God is forgiving. It is who He is. God is giving. He is who He is. See, when He forgives, He shows mercy, right? Mercy is making sure you don't get what you actually deserve. See, sin deserves death, but God has given you mercy so that you don't receive what you deserve. And God is giving, which means he's gracious, and gracious is God giving you what you don't deserve. So God forgives you and you don't get death, but then God is gracious and gives you something more in this moment. We need to understand that our God is such a giving God that he is longing to pour out more. Every good gift, though, comes through relationship and not religion. My favorite things to say, but it's so true. Any relationship that you're in, that you're going after what the person has more than the person, that makes you a gold digger, right? But listen, listen, listen. You have to understand that not only is God giving, but giving is not proof of his goodness. Giving is a byproduct of who he is. God's goodness is the driving factor in his relentless pursuit for you. So the last thing I want you to know is that God Father is searching. He's searching. He's coming after you. Matthew 18, verse 12, what do you think? If a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the ninety-nine on the hill and go after to look for the one that has wandered off? In the same way your Father in heaven is not willing that any of his little ones be lost. Our Heavenly Father is coming after you. He is in pursuit of you. He is longing to be near you, and when you're near God, you can see. Remember, perspective is always determined by location. Scripture says when we draw near to God, he draws near to us. And so the key thing I want us to understand today is not only is God good, but we want to see God properly so we can see what God sees. We want to see God properly so we can be near to him and change our perspective. One of the things we really need to do in this moment as we move forward in this relationship with God is we have to realize that God is longing to be near to us. So today, the only practical thing I want to tell you, the only practical thing I want to share with you is draw near to God. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 13 through 14. You will seek me and you will find me when you seek me, look at this, with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Have you ever partially committed to a relationship? Like, you know what? I'll give them a good bit of my heart, but I'm not going to give them everything I am because you know what? I've been hurt in the past. You see, we keep putting earthly attributes on a heavenly father. We keep saying, listen, I don't want to trust him even if he is my father because my earthly father abandoned me. My earthly father abused me. My earthly father hurt me. And you're taking these earthly attributes and putting them on a perfect father instead of taking your perfect father and learn to see others through his lens. This passage we just read from Jeremiah says, if you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with your whole heart. Now, when we hear seeking and finding, we think something's hiding. We have to know that God is not hiding from us. God is not a God who is hiding from you today. 
No, 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 listen. But it says, seek him and you'll find him. Listen, God is a God who's coming after you. When Adam sinned in the garden, he walked with God. God didn't hide from Adam. Actually, Adam hid from God, and then God came looking. So what does this mean, seek him? God just wants you to long to draw near to him. And I promise you, he's not hiding in any place that you will not find him. I think about it like this. My, my son's six. My daughter's three. And they love to play hide and seek, especially during quarantine when we're in the house a lot. We get real restless and it's like, let's play hide and seek. And I love playing hide and seek. Do I love playing hide and seek because I want to hide from my kids and I long for them to never find me? No. <laughs> With my kids, I often hide in the most obvious of places. I'm not actually even hiding. Sometimes I'm standing in the room with like a blanket over my head, right? Oftentimes, my, my go-to hiding place is I go behind our curtains and our den where they're counting, and, and like it only hits me at the knees, so my legs are hanging out. And it still takes them a second. That's because they're not very good lookers. They get distracted really easy. Come on, somebody. You ever been in search of God and you get distracted by the next thing? Satan says, you know what? Hey, 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 quit pursuing God. Quit looking for God. He's right there in front of you, but I don't want you to see him. The reason you have to seek God is not because God's hiding, but because the enemy is distracting. Do you hear me? God is not hiding from you. The enemy is distracting you. You ever had a task and then you got off the task or you ever played hide and seek as kids and then all of a sudden you're like, ooh, Legos. That's what my kids do. They're like, we're playing hide and seek. I can't wait to find them. And then they're like, ooh, look, the TV's on. Ooh, look, Legos. Oh, look, my little pony, right? Whatever it is in your life, you're like, I'm going to seek after God. I'm going to come after God. And all it takes is opening your eyes and you will find him. But instead, Satan comes, misleads you, misguides you, lies to you, misconstrues the truth. And you never see God and you feel like he's so far away when he's really just standing in the same room. Can't wait for you to find him. He can't wait for you to find him. So I stand behind the curtain and when I hear them getting distracted, I go, I'm over here. And they go, oh yeah. Like you've had that time in your life where you got distracted and all of a sudden something in life caught your attention and made you think, I need to pursue God. And the truth is, he's just been waiting. You see, our Heavenly Father is not hiding from you. You've just gotten distracted. I'll never forget seeing a sign when I was driving. I mean, this is 10 years ago. I was driving through the country somewhere and a sign said, um, a church sign actually said, help bring God back to the state. God has not abandoned you. He has not left you. He is not hiding from you. It's time for us to open our eyes and to see him properly. It's time for us to quit being distracted and pursue him. You see, when I'm hiding from my kids, I'm actually still in the room. I'm right there in the open, oftentimes not hiding at all. And I constantly go, Psst, I'm over here, constantly trying to get their attention. So when God grabs your attention, continue to look for him in that moment. Because here's the truth. The whole reason I play hide and seek with my kids is because I can't wait to see their face when they find me. I can't wait to see their face when they find me and they go, Papa, when they go, there's my father, when they go, that's the one I've been looking for. And I'm like, I've been here just waiting for you to see me. You gotta view God properly. He's not some far off deity who has set the cosmic world into motion and he sits on high as some kind of tyrant of a king. He is a personal God who is with you, who sent his son to be here in flesh, and now he sent his spirit to be here in presence. Feel that nudging? Today, did you hear that? Psst, I'm over here. <laughs> Keep your eyes focused, pursue him. Draw near to him. When you draw near to him, he's drawing near to you. What that really means is when you draw near to him, you're going to find him. When you take a step towards God, he is meeting you in this moment. And everyone who comes face to face with God always leaves changed. Let's pray. God, I believe today some people have felt a nudging from you. One where they want to be in a relationship with you. One where they want to commit their life to you. And if that's you and you're listening to this, I want you to pray this prayer with me and commit your life to God so that you can experience life eternal with him, saving you from your sin and experience more of him today. Jesus, forgive me. God, forgive me. Father, be with me. 
Today I realize I am sinful and that I am not in a relationship with you and I have not put you first in my life. So today I want to let you know I believe in my heart that you are Lord and I want to confess with my life and my mouth that you are Lord as well. So I want to receive salvation. I want to receive this gracious gift of life eternal with you today. Thank you for saving me and thank you for letting me spend every day with you. I commit my life to you. Be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. What an amazing day we've had together today. If you prayed that prayer with me, I want you to know I'm so proud of you. Church family, let's let everyone know how proud we are. We are so excited that you are now this adopted son, adopted daughter who's come into this relationship. You get to experience life eternal in heaven, and you get to pursue him more today. Draw near. So excited for you. For the rest of us, again, social media is the best way to stay in contact during, during this COVID season, so make sure you do that. Also, make sure if you want to give your tithes and offerings today, you go to our website, click give, or you can text the amount you'd like to give to the number on the screen. We also want to encourage those who are regular givers, who are our people who worship with us regularly, who are continually worshiping through their tithes and their offerings, to go ahead and set that up as an automated give if you like, so that it can just be a predictable pattern so that we can continue to advance the kingdom together. Last thing is just a reminder, May 31st, for those who want to gather in person, we'll be at um, the Calera High School Football Stadium at 10.30 a.m. For the rest of you, 10 a.m. on Facebook every week. We love you, and we can't wait to see you soon.